The United States is a nation of dieters, and we'll try everything from Weight Watchers to Atkins to downright starvation. Stick with me today as I talk about the history of dieting. Hello, this is Samantha, and welcome to the June 1st episode of Footnoting History. Today, we'll discuss the history of dieting in the West. First, we'll look at some of the historical motivations for dieting, and then we'll look at some of the crazes that swept the West in the 18th and 19th centuries. The history of dieting starts with the Greeks. For them, dietetica was a way of life intended to help people stay healthy by regulating the food they ate. Although certain guidelines were recommended for everyone, Physicians, including Hippocrates, noted that excess fat created health problems, including infertility and premature death. Both of these conclusions are backed up by modern research. In order to stay healthy, Hippocrates recommended that obese people should balance their eating habits with exercise. In particular, he suggested running long distances and inducing vomiting after a large meal. Most of the evidence about diet in this early period points towards health concerns, but by the end of the Roman era we start to see a shift in cultural attitudes towards fat people. The early Christian ascetics, including individuals like St. Anthony, literally starved themselves. Here, the point was not to be thin or to be healthy, but rather to punish the mortal flesh and to glorify God. Over time, this glorification of deprivation evolved into a negative attitude towards fat people. By the end of the Middle Ages, corpulence was recognized as an outward, unhideable sign of one's innate sinfulness, evidence of gluttony, one of the seven deadly sins. It's no coincidence that saints are generally depicted as rather trim figures, even when they were, in fact, more rotund, like uh, Thomas Aquinas. These harsh ideas about fat people being innately sinful can still be found today. Obese individuals are often viewed as greedy, lazy, or stupid. Although a few medieval writers were concerned with diet, arguably the first best-selling dieting book was written by Bartolomeo Sacchi in 1470. The book attempted to balance healthful eating habits, which were still based on Greek teachings, with pleasure. Initially published in Rome, the book soon became popular in Germany and had been translated into French by the beginning of the following century. As a general rule, diet in the Renaissance was about self-control. The primary advocate of control was the Venetian merchant Luigi Cornario, whose book, The Art of Living Long, is still in print today, almost 450 years after it was written. Cornario was a self-confessed glutton, and spent the first forty years of his life getting fat. Apparently most of those in his social circle had a similar lifestyle. And as he witnessed them getting sick and dying young, he decided he had to regain control of his life. And so he began a diet. He believed that the way to live a long life was to avoid the sin of overconsumption. Pleasure, simply put, was a killer. Often seen as the originator of the low-calorie diet, Cornario wrote that in an ideal day, one should eat only 12 ounces of bread, soup, egg yolks, preferably raw, meat, and 14 ounces of wine. Contrary to modern ideas about diet, many of these early regiments were very restrictive of fluid intake, and virtually none cut out booze. By the end of his life, Cornario had taken his diet to an extreme, and his granddaughter wrote that on a typical day he would consume only one or two egg yolks. As he dieted, Cornario did get thinner, and he believed that he regained not only his health, but also his masculinity. And to me, this is the third key of dieting. By dieting, we are trying not only to prove our moral worth and to become healthy, we are also trying to alter the way that we are perceived in the world. So now that we've covered some of the basics, let us enter the weird world of dieting. And let's start with the diet of George Chain, a 17th century doctor. Like many other dieting gurus, Chain was obese. He had suffered from depression and perceived a strong correlation between his emotional state and his weight. 
After moving from Scotland to London, he ballooned to nearly 450 pounds. When he returned to Scotland, he desperately tried to lose the weight. First, he gave up suppers, meat, and drinking, but he found that when he did this, his isolation and his depression got worse. He then shifted to the milk diet, which appears to have really worked for him. Initially devised as a cure for epilepsy, this diet meant eating only milk products, seeds, breads, roots, and fruit. Later, he began eating only milk and vegetables. Once he was on the mend, Chain moved to Bath, where he set up a very successful practice where he disseminated his diet. His female clients were advised to drink a milk punch made of oranges and milk. They were also encouraged to bathe in milk mixed with warm water and brandy. There is no way of knowing exactly how far this diet spread, but it was popular among the wealthy visitors to Bath. It was also used by several famous writers and philosophers, including David Hume, John Wellesley, and Alexander Pope, and it inspired at least one milk-themed restaurant in Paris. By the 19th century, celebrities began to play a significant role in, in shaping eating habits. By far the most important dieting figure of the early part of the 19th century was Lord Byron, the mad, bad, and dangerous-to-know poet. Like many other diet writers, Byron struggled with his own weight. At his height, he may have weighed as much as 420 pounds. However, he quickly dropped down to a mere 137 pounds and managed to stay there once he began his dieting regime. There is a good chance that Byron was actually anorexic, and he was certainly obsessed with his weight and proudly described himself on at least one occasion as as thin as a skeleton. Again, like those before him, Byron achieved weight loss through deprivation. Most of the time he ate nothing but biscuits and soda water. When those were not available, he would eat potatoes drenched in vinegar. In fact, Byron was a huge fan of vinegar for its appetite-suppressant qualities. He also consumed Epsom salts, magnesia, and strong laxatives. What made Byron so dangerous was that he was incredibly popular. He had followers, and he did not hesitate to make his preferences about how they should live known. Byron was particularly intolerant of heavy women. Women, he said, should never be seen eating anything other than lobster salad and champagne. But then, of course, when his own mistress became too thin, he dumped her and criticized her new shape. In England, it seems there was a whole generation of girls dosing themselves with cups full of vinegar each day to try to attain Byron's ideal. It's also thought that Byron's influence may have caused fashionable men to start weighing themselves regularly. Um, and this may have actually had a, a real impact on the way that we view obesity. And we started defining ourselves by weight rather than by appearance alone. Around the same time, Brillat Savarin, a French lawyer, came up with the first low-carb diet, which forbade eating starches, sugars, and all foods made with flour. If this was not enough to lose weight, then starvation and additional exercise should be used to supplement the regimen. He also invented an anti-corpulence belt, which should be tightened each night in order to help force the fat off the middle, and he advised his followers to take quinine to combat weight gain. Although advocating fairly drastic measures, Brillat Savarin condemned the followers of Byron for taking things too far, and wrote a detailed case study of a young woman he had known who, after taking up the vinegar diet, succumbed to horrendous nutrition and died. The low-carb approach to dieting became much more popular towards the end of the 19th century with the creation of the Banting system. This approach became so popular that the phrase, I am Banting, became synonymous with dieting. The originator of the system, William Banting, was actually an undertaker in London, and he devised the system for his own benefit, using it to set, shed nearly 30 pounds in the first few months. Rather than copying earlier dieting writers, Banting took his cue from farmers and specifically avoided the foods that they used to fatten animals. However, he feared that his system would not be appreciated, coming as it did from someone with absolutely no medical qualifications or celebrity, and so he originally printed his pamphlet at his own expense. Nevertheless, it quickly caught on across the world. Perhaps one of the greatest perks of this particular diet was that unlike most of those who came before him, 
Banting absolutely forbade his followers from starving themselves, and he did not impose an excessively regimented system upon them. Although he did suggest meal plans, as long as people ate foods rich in protein and fat and avoided carbohydrates, they could lose weight. And anyone who is paying attention in the dieting world today knows that, at this point, that the Atkins Revolutionary Diet proposed in 1972 really wasn't all that revolutionary. Another popular dieting craze, devised by Horace Fletcher at the end of the 19th century, involved chewing. That's right, chewing. This diet allowed people to consume whatever they wanted, but each bite had to be chewed a prescribed number of times depending on the food being eaten. All flavor and texture had to disappear from the food, and then it should be spat out. Fletcher was very pleased with his success, and this success was demonstrated from his own perspective by the fact that he only had to defecate once each week, and that his stool was soft and odorless. He often liked to prove this point by actually carrying around a sample with him. In spite of this unsavory practice, Fletcherism caught on at the top of society, and it became quite common to organize parties where guests could sit around counting how many times each bite of food had been chewed. Today, I've stuck primarily to discussing dieting tactics, but people also tried to achieve thinness by squishing themselves into corsets, adopting new exercise regimens, taking assorted drugs, including cocaine, which was used to facilitate weight loss in the United States until it was outlawed in 1914, or even eating tapeworms. As time progressed, so too has the desperation to get slim or to stay slim. In the 1920s in particular, women sought to stay straight and boyish, the shape that they wanted could only be achieved through starvation, and even when curves came back into style in the 1940s, women were expected to stay slim around the middle. It's not entirely clear why the obsession with slimming has gotten worse over the recent century. It is possible that our obsession is in part driven by the fact that Americans are getting fatter, possibly because we now live a much more sedentary lifestyle than our forebearers. Another interesting hypothesis has been put forward by Peter Stearns, who sees the growing hatred of fat in America as an answer to consumerism. He believes that Americans became obsessed with staying trim in order to assuage our guilt for having too many things. Instead of giving the things back, Americans living at the turn of the 20th century created a new, almost devotional obligation. Staying thin became a personal challenge, and failure was met by self-loathing, as it is still today. I would like to add, however, that regardless of the reasons for the continued dieting craze, many of the diets that we try now have been tried before and have failed. Meanwhile, dieting itself has become a hugely commercialized industry, which is aimed at getting consumers to spend money and to feel dissatisfied. Perhaps we do well to return to the Greek philosophy of just trying to eat well rather than trying out every new gimmick. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to check out our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find further reading suggestions related to this week's podcast, as well as links to our Facebook page and Twitter feed. Join us next week for the second installment in our Running in History series, when we'll be looking at competitive running in ancient Greece. Until then, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. See you next week!